Okay, we back in Queens. This is another installment in the Kingpin Unanimous series. We are not going to waste any time, let's get into it. Crack cocaine emerged in the early 1980s as a cheaper, more potent form of cocaine. It was quickly adopted by drug dealers and users due to its affordability and the intense high it provided. Crack houses, where users could buy and consume crack cocaine, became prevalent in many neighborhoods across New York City. These locations often attracted criminal activity and violence. The crack epidemic disproportionately affected low-income neighborhoods and communities of color in New York City. These communities bore the brunt of the violence and social decay associated with crack cocaine. Law enforcement agencies in New York City, including the NYPD, launched aggressive crackdowns on drug-related crime during the 1980s. This led to increased arrests and incarceration rates, particularly for drug offenses. One of the more notorious dudes to come up during this time was Pappy Mason. Pappy Mason was said to have came up in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, but was born in Alabama. Pappy's legacy was firmly rooted in Queens. Brooklyn, in general, bred some of the toughest cats in America and was the epitome of thug life among the five boroughs of New York City. Pappy was raised amidst this rugged environment, learning the ropes of manhood in Brooklyn's unforgiving streets. Initially affiliated with the gang known as the Jolly Stompers, he later transitioned into a stick-up artist. While Pappy wasn't known for narcotics dealings, his reputation as a hothead who despised law enforcement preceded him. Even in his youth, he brazenly challenged police authority, displaying a defiant attitude that characterized his persona. Rebelling against authority was ingrained in him from the start, and he preferred settling disputes with his fists. Pappy was inherently adept at combat. His turbulent life led him down a path of conflict and incarceration, with juvenile detention centers, including Spofford, becoming his temporary home. Incarcerated for attempted murder during his teenage years, he found it difficult to evade trouble. Amidst his frequent stays at Spofford Youth House, Pappy crossed paths with another young brawler from the Seven Crowns gang, Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols. United by their prowess in combat, they forged a bond rooted in mutual respect. Both espoused the ethos of looking out for one another, recognizing their shared values and skills. Spofford, renowned as a facility for troubled youths, housed only the most troublesome offenders. Mostly every gangster in New York City history has served a stint in Spofford. While some entered with a degree of delinquency, prolonged exposure to the institution's harsh environment often exacerbated their behavior. Pappy's disdain for authority, once directed at police, now extended to the correctional officers, leading to frequent clashes. Because of this, he maxed out and served his whole seven-year sentence. In 1983, a quarter of his 23 years had already been spent behind bars. By the time Pappy returned to the streets in 83, Fat Cat had already established himself as a prominent drug dealer along 150th Street in southeast Queens. Seeking out Fat Cat upon his release, Pappy was promptly hired as security for a generous sum of $1,000 per week. His intimidating presence made even the most reckless individuals think twice before crossing him. His no-nonsense demeanor was matched only by his fierce loyalty to Fat Cat. Pappy emerged as Cat's right-hand man on the streets, chosen for his unwavering determination and fierce loyalty. He executed his duties with ruthless efficiency, leaving a trail of violence in his wake. In broad daylight, he brutally assaulted a call girl who had dared to steal from Cat. He didn't hesitate to eliminate a rival dealer attempting to encroach on Cat's territory. Pappy even went as far as killing a dissatisfied customer outside a church who dared to question the quality of Cat's product. Such acts of aggression only served to enhance Pappy's fearsome reputation, shrouding him in an aura of mystique. With his distinctive Rastafarian dreadlocks and adopted Jamaican dialect, many mistook him for a native of Jamaica itself. Informants whispered to the police about that dreadlocked guy, Pappy, identifying him as Cat's ruthless enforcer, the most feared individual on the streets. Street legends spun tales of Pappy's brutal methods, including torturing individuals with hot curling irons to extract information or inflict punishment. Pappy's relentless brutality earned him the trust and favor of Fat Cat, who rewarded him with a lucrative drug spot in the 40 projects, allowing Pappy to expand his operation and amass wealth with impunity. The enforcer for Cat's organization decided to establish his own faction, giving rise to Pappy's crew known as the Bebos. With dreads adorning their heads, the Bebos delved into the drug trade, dealing in cocaine and heroin. 
Following Pappy, his crew mimicked his mannerisms, adopting his violent tendencies and even his Jamaican-inflected speech. The Bebos fully embraced Rastafarian culture, incorporating its principles into their daily lives. While Pappy maintained a presence on 150th Street, his crew held down operations in the 40 projects. They had jackets with Bebo emblazoned on them. Although Pappy was the unofficial leader of the crew, they were all men, stood on business, and maintained mutual respect amongst one another. Every individual was responsible for holding one's own. Despite leading his own crew and managing his own drug spot, Pappy remained responsible for cat security. Pappy's reputation as a fearless and unrestrained individual extended beyond his affiliation with Cat. Even the notorious Supreme recognized Pappy's authenticity and thoroughness. When crack cocaine flooded Queens, it brought about profound changes, particularly in terms of heightened violence, with Pappy Mason positioned squarely in the midst of the turmoil. When Fat Cat encountered legal trouble in 1985, Pappy was prepared to take drastic measures to ensure his freedom. As Fat Cat was being escorted to a police car, Pappy stealthily approached the arresting officer, ready to use his firearm to facilitate their escape. However, upon seeing Fat Cat signal to stand down, Pappy retreated, gun still in hand, into the shadows. Despite Fat Cat's imprisonment, Pappy remained fiercely loyal, visiting him in jail and issuing veiled threats to those associated with his arrest. However, Cat's parole officer, Brian Rooney, would be murdered. Suspicion fell heavily on Pappy, who was subsequently arrested based on testimony from a crew member, Perry Bellamy. On October 10, 1985, Bellamy arranged to meet Rooney near Basley Pond Park in South Jamaica by claiming to have information about one of his cases. There, a hit squad acting on Nichols's orders pulled up alongside Rooney's car and opened fire, killing him with five shots. Bellamy confessed that Pappy did the shooting. At the time of his arrest, Pappy was found in possession of a loaded firearm, further incriminating him. Despite pressure from law enforcement to implicate Fat Cat in the murder, Pappy maintained his silence, refusing to betray his boss or his principals. As a result, he joined Fat Cat in the Queen's House of Detention, solidifying his status as a street legend during his incarceration. Even while locked up, Pappy displayed his generosity and foresight, bestowing a lavish gold and diamond ring shaped like Africa, valued at $40,000, upon crew member, Philip Marshall Copeland, during a visit at Rikers Island. The ring was intended to fund future ventures for the Bebo crew. Despite being behind bars, Pappy remained in contact with his street associates, frequently calling them from Rikers to vent his frustrations about law enforcement. Rumors swirled in the streets, with whispers suggesting that the Bebos were responsible for the murder of the parole officer. However, Pappy vehemently denied any involvement, asserting, I didn't kill no P.O. Prior to the commencement of his trial in January 1986, residents of Queens expressed solidarity with Pappy, confident that no one would dare testify against him. Such was the extent of Pappy's influence and reputation for ruthlessness that he instilled fear in the hearts of many. He was a ruthless killer. His influence was immense. In the lead up to the trial, both the prosecutor and judge received anonymous death threats, indicative of the pervasive intimidation tactics employed by Pappy supporters. Just as the trial was set to begin, the star witness, Perry Bellamy, unexpectedly refused to testify, effectively thwarting the prosecution's case. In the absence of live testimony, the jury was left to consider only Bellamy's recorded confession. They were all there when the parole officer got killed, Perry Bellamy's voice echoed from the tape player. Pappy just opened fire. Pappy got him. It happened so fast. Despite Bellamy's recorded testimony, the absence of a live witness willing to testify in court resulted in a hung jury, and he was acquitted at retrial. As a result of Bellamy flipping on the crew, drastic measures were taken. When Fat Cat learned of that, he ordered another Queens gangster, Brian Glaze Gibbs, to take vengeance on Bellamy. The drug lord plotted to kill Bellamy's mother, but changed his mind, making the father, Maurice Bellamy, the target. Glaze had risen to a top eight in Nichols's organization after building his own crack and heroin business out of East New York Cypress Hills houses that spread drugs across Brooklyn. He had already killed and had no qualms about killing again. Since Perry Bellamy was protected by the authorities, Fat Cat couldn't get to him. The initial idea was to murder one of Perry's parents so he would come to the funeral. There, he said, his guys would knock out the cops with tranquilizers and then kill Perry Bellamy. However, things didn't go like this. 
Instead, Glaze sent the hitman to a laundromat on Linden Avenue. It was supposed to look like a robbery. The person was supposed to ask for change and then execute him, but the gunman just walked in and shot Maurice Bellamy in the head. We will go more into Glaze's story in another video. Anyway, let's get back to the story. Another member of Nichols's drug gang, Randolph Lucas, admitted firing the fatal shots as part of a 1992 guilty plea to federal racketeering charges and was sentenced to 29 years in prison. Three other men, including Lucas's brother, Eric Lucas, and Christopher Williams, aka Jughead, also pleaded guilty as accomplices to Rooney's killing. Pappy, after posting bail in February 1988 following the mistrial, made a brazen gesture toward the prosecutor, forming an imaginary gun with his thumb and index finger, and mimicking shooting. With his freedom restored, albeit temporarily, Pappy embarked on a course of action that would send shockwaves across the nation. Only 10 days back on the streets, Pappy found himself in a confrontation with a beat cop while enjoying a beer on a South Jamaica street corner. The officer, known as the Iceman, instructed Pappy to conceal his beer, igniting a heated exchange. Unaccustomed to being challenged by law enforcement and already not fond of authority, Pappy reacted with fury. He declared the officer's disrespect deserving of death. Subsequent death threats prompted the police to remove the officer from active duty for his safety. Just a week after his release, Pappy found himself back at Rikers Island following the remand of his gun case. Despite his brief stint on the streets, locals speculated that Pappy had already begun planning his next move. Unbeknownst to many, Pappy Mason was about to set into motion a series of events with far-reaching consequences that would reverberate for decades to come. Pappy purportedly conveyed a chilling directive to Marshall. We lose one, they lose one. Marshall was the dude who Pappy gave the ring to while he was locked up. Eager to assert his authority even from behind bars, Pappy sought to send a powerful message through the Bebos. Despite his incarceration, he wanted to demonstrate that he still wielded influence and could issue commands. The intended message was clear. Pappy remained a force to be reckoned with. Faced with dwindling power in the wake of Cat's imprisonment, Pappy recognized the need for a drastic measure to maintain control over the neighborhood. Thus, he orchestrated a plan that would shake the foundation of law enforcement and the entire community. Around 3.30 a.m., on February 26, 1988, Edward Byrne, a rookie cop, was sitting in his marked patrol car on 107th Avenue and in Wood Street, in the South Jamaica section of Queens. He was assigned to keep an eye on the house of a local Guyanese immigrant, who had repeatedly called the police to report illegal activities on his street. The house had been previously firebombed on two occasions, and the owner repeatedly threatened. Despite the recent violence and an ongoing crime wave overtaking South Queens, Byrne was assigned to the post alone. As Byrne sat in his car, another driver pulled up beside him. Two men exited, and one of them knocked on the passenger side window of Byrne's cruiser, while a second man crept up on the driver's side. The man on the driver's side shot Byrne in the head five times with a 38 caliber pistol two other men acted as lookouts. Byrne later died at the hospital. He had just turned 22. The fancy cars are still fixtures outside the 40s projects, the South Jamaica building where a cop's murder was planned. Four young men accused of executing rookie cop Edward Byrne. He was gunned down while guarding a witness in a drug case. The tragic murder, orchestrated as retaliation for a witness's testimony against local drug dealers, made headlines nationwide and prompted a significant escalation in the war on drugs. The shocking incident led to the establishment of New York's Tactical Narcotics Task Force TNT. Although informants initially implicated Jamaican individuals from Brooklyn in the crime, Pappy was already incarcerated by the time of the officer's death, having been imprisoned the day before. Immediately following the tragic murder, authorities apprehended four suspects associated with the Bebo crew. They were Todd Scott, Scott Cobb, David McClary, and Marshall. Marshall directed the nefarious plot, with Mason pulling his strings. Cobb was the wheelman, driving the hitman to and from the scene. Scott's role was to distract Officer Byrne from his car's passenger side. McClary shot Officer Byrne five times in the head from point-blank range. In a surprising turn of events, three of the suspects quickly confessed on video, incriminating not only themselves, but also implicating Fat Cat and Pappy Mason. The lone holdout, Marshall, remained silent. Law enforcement seized upon the opportunity to portray the incident as a calculated order from Fat Cat, aimed at instilling fear and asserting dominance over any opposition. 
However, beneath the surface, a different narrative was beginning to take shape. Viola Nichols, Kat's sister, conveyed Kat's fury over Pappy's actions, labeling them as foolish and detrimental to their criminal enterprise. Pappy attempted to justify his actions in a conversation with Viola, citing disrespect from a police officer who instructed him to conceal a can of beer in a brown paper bag. However, Kat soon realized that Pappy had targeted the wrong cop in the execution-style murder, allegedly ordered from prison as revenge against law enforcement. The situation worsened when, on August 12, 1988, federal authorities indicted Fat Cat and his entire crew on racketeering charges, resulting in widespread arrests and the seizure of millions of dollars in narcotics. Specifically, there was a claim that $20 million in drugs were seized. Pappy's mom was among the indicted, and so was Cat's sister, Viola Nichols. Amidst the chaos, Pappy received a three-and-a-half to seven-year sentence for the gun charge. At his sentencing, Pappy maintained his innocence, denouncing the allegations against him and Fat Cat as baseless. The federal case implicated Pappy and Fat Cat in orchestrating the murder of the police officer. While the Triggerman and his three accomplices in the state case had already been convicted and sentenced, the federal authorities were now targeting the alleged ringleaders of the criminal operation. Todd Scott, from the 40 Projects, was identified as the individual who implicated Pappy Mason in ordering the hit. However, he wasn't the only one who betrayed his allegiance. Allegedly, in a clandestine court session on September 29, 1989, Fat Cat agreed to testify against Pappy Mason. The feds offered Pap and Cat 40 years under the old law to plead guilty to the kingpin charge for their mother's freedom. According to Fat Cat, Pap refused to plead guilty, so he took the plea deal. Brian Glaze Gibbs was also intertwined with the situation, and he too was faced with the same circumstances. The revelation of Fat Cat's purported betrayal sparked outrage in the streets and within the prosecutor's office, but despite the accusations, Pappy maintains to this day that Fat Cat never testified against him and that Cat's name does not appear in any of his legal documents. Pappy Mason found himself standing trial alone in the federal racketeering case. Determined not to be manipulated by the legal system, he staunchly declared, I'm not letting these individuals manipulate me. Despite the weight of the charges and the added complication of his mother facing indictment, Pappy remained resolute, drawing strength from her faith in divine intervention. His lawyer, Harry Butchelder, attempted to mount an insanity defense during the November 1989 trial, but it proved ineffective. Pappy's volatile behavior in court led to his isolation by the judge, effectively prompting him to boycott his own trial. Instead, he opted to monitor proceedings from his cell via a specially installed speaker system. Frustrated by what he perceived as a miscarriage of justice, Pappy decried the trial as a sham, likening it to a Ku Klux Klan meeting, rather than a legitimate legal proceeding. Scott Cobb emerged as a key witness, claiming foreknowledge of Mason's plan to kill a police officer, with orders allegedly given to Marshall to pay $8,000 per head. Do you think the police will ever be able to stop crack in the streets of this city or any other city? It'll never go away? No. Why? Never go away. I think because you put away one of us that is over that, that is over with. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, 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 like plants growing. Plant, you just grow, it just grows. You take, you take, you tear, you tear the leaf off, it's still gonna grow. And the same way with the gotta crack be, organization. Gotta go to the roots. Where are the roots of the crack organization? Ain't, ain't no roots to it. Todd was standing there laughing. At the car, like he said, Dave said, talking to him in the car. He, 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 oh, you blew his brains out. Yo, one of the bullets came through the door. He said, this is, this is what Todd was saying. And Todd, he said, Todd said it was like a joke. He said, he shot the cop's brains. He said, I seen the cop's brains come out. I seen the brains. Testimony also came from Mike Bones, a member of Kat's crew, and Viola Nichols, Kat's sister, who spent three days on the witness stand. Notably absent from the proceedings was Fat Cat himself, who was never called to testify. At trial, the evidence established that Pappy's mother, Claudia Mason, was an active liaison between her son and the Bebo's organization. According to Viola Nichols, Claudia Mason regularly relayed instructions concerning narcotics activity from Pappy to Bebo's members. In addition to acting as a conduit for instructions, Claudia Pappy monitored the activities of various Bebo's members to ensure their compliance with Pappy's instructions. For example, in March 1988, Claudia informed Viola Nichols that Bebo's member Albert Ingram would be stripped up for failing to properly perform his narcotics-related duties, which included the delivery of cocaine and money. 
Shortly thereafter, Claudia ordered Ingram to return narcotics and money, as well as a van and a car he had been using, to her and Bebo's member Vanessa Branch. The amount of narcotics and money returned by Ingram fell short of Pappy's expectations, however, and she demanded that he produce additional narcotics and money. Claudia's role in the Bebo's organization was corroborated by approximately 65 recorded phone conversations intercepted under a court-authorized wiretap on her home telephone. The government also introduced evidence obtained in a search of Claudia's home. The search was authorized by a warrant based upon a confidential informant's affidavit, describing Pappy's recruitment of the informant to package narcotics at Pappy's residence, and numerous wiretapped phone conversations. The search was led by FBI agent Theodore Gardner. Agent Gardner testified that the following items were discovered in a bedroom in Claudia Pappy's home. Approximately one kilogram of crack, some of which had been packaged into vials, a loaded handgun, a pair of earrings marked Bebo, and two safe deposit box keys. FBI agent Christopher Favo testified that a search of Claudia Pappy's safe deposit box revealed jewelry, some of which was marked Bebo, and $19,800 in cash. The cash was seized and, in accordance with FBI procedure, was deposited with the United States Marshals. Neither the dates nor the serial numbers of the currency were recorded before it was deposited. She was sentenced to two concurrent terms of 120 months imprisonment. They're claiming that Pappy and I orchestrated this, remarked Philip Marshall Copeland. But I never had any discussions with him, nor did I even meet with him. So I can confidently say he had no involvement. David McClary, the accused shooter, vehemently denied ever receiving an order from Pappy. Even Pappy himself asserted his innocence, questioning, why on earth would I kill a cop? Despite their protests, Pappy was ultimately convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment, following a three-day deliberation by the jury. Despite his relatively small physical stature, Pappy's fearless demeanor and unwillingness to back down earned him a fearsome reputation. Stories abound from within the confines of prison walls, recounting Pappy's relentless clashes with the guards and extraction teams. According to these tales, he employs makeshift defenses, wrapping his head with towels to cushion blows from batons, and dousing himself in baby oil to evade the guards' grasp during confrontations. It's said that he perpetually battles against the guards, resorting to hurling excrement and urine through the food tray door of his 24-hour lockdown cell. Pappy's existence is confined to perpetual isolation, having long forfeited any semblance of normal prison life. Despite his apparent descent into madness, inmates still hold him in high regard for his fearless nature. Let's go a little more into what Pappy was dealing with after he was arrested. So, on August 11, 1988, Pappy, along with other members of the Bebos and another drug gang, was arrested on federal narcotics conspiracy charges. He was detained at the Metropolitan Correctional Center, MCC. At the MCC, Pappy's disruptive conduct earned him disciplinary segregation. After he attacked two co defendants with a homemade weapon and started a fire in his cell because he was denied access to a phone, Pappy was transferred to the Federal Correctional Institute at Otisville on August 7, 1989. His conduct at Otisville placed him once again in disciplinary segregation. On August 15, 1989, Pappy was charged alone in a superseding indictment with, among other crimes, ordering the murder of Officer Byrne. After arraignment on the new charges, Pappy was again placed in the MCC. When staff noted a sudden change in his behavior, he was sent to MCC staff psychologist, Dr. Parr. Dr. Parr noted that Pappy displayed paranoid delusions accompanied by agitation and violent outbursts, selective mutism, social withdrawal, marked weight loss, and poor hygiene, and recommended that he be sent to a forensic psychiatric facility for evaluation. On September 15, 1989, Pappy was transferred to the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri, Springfield. Pappy submitted to an initial interview with Dr. D, a clinical psychologist at Springfield, but thereafter refused to permit further interviews, psychological tests, or a physical examination. Based on the initial interview and about 15 brief visits to Pappy's cell, Dr. D wrote a report that he filed with the district court on October 23, 1989. He concluded that Pappy understood the charges against him, that Pappy's unwillingness to cooperate with the Springfield staff was volitional and not due to mental illness, and that he was competent to stand trial. Pappy was returned to the MCC in late October 1989. 
On November 3, 1989, Pappy was visited in jail by his mother and his court-appointed attorney, B. Their purpose was to discuss a government offer to consider making a downward departure motion for Pappy's mother, who faced sentencing for a recent narcotics conviction, if Pappy would plead guilty. According to an affidavit that B filed with the district court on November 7, 1989, Pappy was uncooperative and abusive during both the November 3 visit and a subsequent meeting three days later. He accused B of lying about his co-defendant's willingness to testify against him at trial and conniving with the district court to have him transferred to the bug house. According to B, Pappy at times had a vacant stare, was unresponsive to questions, and did not comprehend the effect that his insistence on going to trial might have on his mother's sentence. Because he was professionally uncomfortable that Pappy understood his advice or trusted that he would work in Pappy's best interests, B requested that the district court replace him with another attorney. On November 7, 1989, Pappy appeared before the district court. When the judge remarked, your lawyer indicated that you had some problems that you want to raise with me, Pappy rejoined, it's your lawyer, it ain't my lawyer. What can I say, all I can do is keep getting torched. Moments later, the judge inquired, do you wish Mr. B to represent you or not? Pappy replied, I don't wish to go to the hospital and the police be kicking on my doors and hollering and screaming on me. I don't wish a lot of things. I don't have no choice. After noting the strange behavior described in the B affidavit, the court stated to Pappy that one of our concerns is that you understand what's going on around you so that you could assist your lawyer in preparing a defense. Pappy again answered unresponsively. I cannot prepare for anything. I'm locked in 23 hours a day. How can I prepare for anything? I'm in bug houses. How can I prepare for anything? When the judge asked if Pappy would submit to another psychiatric examination, Pappy did not answer the question. Instead he asked, what is it I'm charged with? I don't even know what I'm charged with. The judge then read Pappy the indictment. After he read count one, which charged a RICO offense, Pappy asked for a definition of racketeering. Pappy then expressed confusion as to why, after his initial arrest on state charges, he was facing federal charges other than conspiracy. The district court explained that the government had filed a superseding indictment. As the hearing drew to a close, the court asked Pappy if he had any other questions. Pappy responded, yeah. I just wanted to know my status, why I got to keep going through these tribulations. If you're going to give me life imprisonment, you're going to give me life anyway. He expressed doubt that he could get a fair trial and answered questions about whether he wanted to retain B as his counsel, with complaints about having no access to the prison law library and being asked to deal with legal papers, which ain't dealing with the same issue. Finally, Pappy agreed to talk with a psychiatrist who would determine his competency, saying, yeah, I got to. I ain't got no choice. Pappy's resolve was short-lived. On November 16, when Dr. Ney accompanied B to the MCC, Pappy refused to see her, expressing distrust of her because she worked for the government. On November 27, 1989, Pappy appeared in court for jury selection. B requested a hearing on the issue of Pappy's competency to stand trial. The judge questioned the need for the hearing since Pappy had already been found competent. On November 29, 1989, Pappy attended the trial in the morning when several police officers who investigated Officer Byrne's murder testified. During one detective's testimony, Pappy stood up, causing the court to call a recess. B informed the court that Pappy wished to return to his cell. The court explained again that Pappy's decision was unwise, that he was entitled to participate, that he had missed a significant part of the trial, and that by assisting his attorney, he might be able to convince the jury that the government did not carry the burden of proving his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Aggrieved that he was being charged with federal charges relating to the murder of Officer Byrne, Pappy stated that there was no sense me going to trial and that he wanted to return to his cell. Nevertheless, Pappy attended the proceedings for the rest of that day. By December 4, the next day of trial, a closed-circuit camera had been added to allow Pappy to see the trial from the holding cell. Pappy did in fact watch some of the trial in this manner, although technical problems caused him to miss the summations and one day in which evidence was taken. The jury found Pappy guilty on all counts in the indictment. Shortly after his conviction, Pappy's behavior became more erratic. He refused to shower, change his clothes, clean his cell, or interact with MCC staff or inmates. When denied cosmetic items, Pappy broke a window and threatened to kill a corrections officer. 
As a result of Pappy's behavior, the government asked for a report from the MCC on his mental status. The court ordered Dr. Dan, a forensic psychiatrist, to evaluate Pappy's competency to be sentenced. Dr. S examined Pappy on May 23, 1990, and found him apparently so overwhelmed by his rage and paranoid beliefs that he could not address himself to the reality of his legal situation. Dr. S noted that Pappy had apparently regressed to the point of massive denial of stressful reality, particularly the fact of his conviction, and ranted and raved about revenge. Dr. G diagnosed Pappy as suffering from an antisocial personality disorder and probable atypical psychosis, but not active psychosis. She believed that he was not clearly psychotic in 1989, although she could not rule out the possibility of psychosis, especially after his conviction. She reported that Pappy's paranoia may have reached delusional intensity some time that year, and that he also may have regressed in isolation, becoming neglectful of his personal hygiene. Nonetheless, Dr. G decided that, in the aftermath of his trial, Pappy understood only too well what has happened and has had some difficulty adjusting to the prospect of a lifetime incarceration and to the betrayal of his friends. She noted that Pappy had been stable since winter and spring of 1992. In sum, Pappy was probably neither a malingerer nor psychotic, but more likely he was so preoccupied with being respected, with power, strength and violence, that he had suddenly lost external control, and decided that the only way to deal with it was to resist and not participate actively in a lost cause, a conscious decision over which he had control. Dr. G concluded that he was competent at the time of trial, though probably depressed, and was currently competent to be sentenced. On January 7, 1994, weighing all the evidence, the district court ruled that Pappy had been competent to stand trial and was competent to be sentenced. The district court sentenced Pappy to life imprisonment. The Jamaicans consider Pappy as one of their own, despite his American roots. Regarding the fat cat snitching allegations, Pappy remains resolute. They're lying about fat cat and me, I swear, Pappy asserts, emphasizing his bond with cat is akin to brothers. However, some question Pappy's credibility due to his alleged medication with Thorazine. While controversy surrounds him, Pappy's notoriety remains undiminished. Despite three decades behind bars, his legacy endures, intertwined with that of Fat Cat. Unlike Fat Cat, Pappy is revered as a principled individual, while doubts linger over Cat's integrity. Yet, a chilling truth emerges. Regardless of who issued the order, the bullets that claimed Edward Byrne's life were intended for another officer, known as Iceman. But this about wraps this story up though. This was the story of Howard Pappy Mason, the most feared man on the street. But as always, stay low and thanks for watching.